Hi everyone, uh, I'm Aaron Grossman. This is Marilyn Stefan. We're just two teachers. Uh, before we launch into content, we've decided to reverse engineer this just a touch and remind everyone to please subscribe to our YouTube channel, visit our new uh, website, justtwoteachers.com, and then Marilyn has set up a Facebook page. Also just two teachers. Um, and if you click uh, through that, uh, we will approve uh, you joining the group. So this is about unit two. Uh, within the benchmark materials, grade three, ways, characters, shapes, stories. And what we're gonna be focusing on over the next three weeks, apart from what we're gonna describe, things that we're gonna be doing, we're always working backwards from this big essential question, how do our actions influence our lives? Um, and so with that, let's just start with a hot tip, something that we're gonna hit these kids with to make them more successful and make our instructional practices that much stronger. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, if you have had any GLAD strategy training, uh, process grid is one activity or one strategy that is used quite often to um, gather information from several stories or several pieces of um, text. And you keep track of each um, element or each story. And then in the end, you have a nice, where everything is together so that you can compare and contrast. So it's a visual rep representation and analysis of the fable for the genre of fables this time. And I believe on day 14, or day five, mm -hmm. lesson 14, there is a mini lesson on comparing and contrasting. So this would be a good piece to have with all the student information. Um, perfect. Our oh format for these things is typically we're going to reflect on how unit one went and then we're going to follow that up with uh, our first initial reactions to the benchmark material itself and what we like and then ultimately we're going to end with some opportunities to elevate and predictions about how we think things are going to transpire in our classrooms. Okay. So with that, Marilyn, um, tell us how unit one went for you. Unit one actually was more successful than, not than I thought. I thought it would be pretty successful. I actually thought the kids would enjoy it. Um, and they did, they did. They wrote letters to our principal um, thinking that they found out that kids could actually make a difference. They wrote letters to the principal. They came up with a class constitution on their own and um, they really enjoyed the reader's theater. So um, those were the things that were very successful. And I think they were able to, at the end, answer the essential question. And um, if I can pause here before I share what I liked um, and how it went for me, um, you did that Reader's Theater and I know that I've received a number of questions. I suspect you've received the same thing about how do you ultimately run that with fewer resources? So I think there's six and six? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And actually, strangely, I opened up um, the next set for the for um, this unit, and there are 12 of each. Okay. But there were only six in the first one. You're, you're right about that. So I used the online format because it's on there. The students could have it on their Chromebook or even on the iPad and use that as the text, the extra students who didn't have a book. Um, and I do have to say a lot of them practiced at lunchtime because they wanted to, though. I didn't say they had to. Mm -hmm. um, so that is how we, we had extra time to do that. Um, and that they had the books. They shared a microphone during the performance too. Did They just passed it. Oh, and I think, right, we're always working backwards from this idea of we want as much fluency practice, and when we're doing a reader's theater, then we're attending more, much more than just rate and accuracy, mm -hmm. but also that prosody piece. And so. I was excited because last time we talked, that was one thing that I thought I was lacking. I wasn't doing any fluency, and um, I saw how important it was and how much the kids enjoyed it. And they took the books home. Some of them took the books home, too. That's so great. So I trusted that they would bring it back, and they did. OK. Um, and then for me, uh, we did this emergency uh, vlog. And so if you haven't seen that, that's available on our YouTube channel. And in that, I acknowledge that I'm still a whole group. So when I'm reflecting on Unit 1, largely speaking, I did that mm -hmm. um, whole group. Um, I posted to JustTwoTeachers.com my own prompt, which is I wanted to culminate and end with not just the uh, writing that they were doing with the performance tasks, but also a way for them to reflect on all the content that we, we'd been working with. So I asked that uh, going through that close read, they pick out somebody who exemplified civic virtue, and then they wrote to acclaim, evidence, and reasoning. That was uh, a great question. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And so that's at just two teachers within that unit one tab. Um, How did that go? And that went nicely. So. Um, 
you know, I think we've both done a series of mini lessons mm -hmm. to complement some of the writing within Benchmark. And I brought with me, and again, I'm not trying to game it, but excited about the fact that this is sort of a standard for the kind of link that I saw from my students. And then in this case, uh, we scaffolded the three paragraphs. So my students started with a rhetorical question device, and so we practiced that in the classroom mm -hmm. where to grab the reader's attention rather than just starting with the claim he wrote, have you ever been, let's see, have you ever done something brave? Have you ever helped someone? Have you helped African Americans? Rosa Parks did. And then that led to his claim about Rosa Parks had civic virtue, and then he gave evidence from the text and ended with some kind of closure, and really simple at this point. So his closure was just, now you know why Rosa Parks has civic virtue. Um, and I think that's totally appropriate that's for excellent. where we are uh, six weeks into the school year. Great, so um, that's how things went for us. And so maybe we can talk about uh, what we like about unit two in which we're addressing this big question, how do our actions influence our lives? Okay, I'm really actually excited to continue with all the writing. I think that the kids have enjoyed looking back in their journals and seeing how much they've written. They, they commented on, wow, look how much I've written. And um, I also like the text. I think the kids are gonna enjoy the text, the stories, the characters, and the messages even, mm -hmm. and relating it to their own lives. Um, I will be really excited to do the Reader's Theater again because I think characters lend themselves to a little bit more theatrics, I yes. guess. So um, really looking forward to that. Uh, and I think those are really smart observations. I know we both went to the training where we were told the kids are going to like the Reader's Theater, mm -hmm. and I think it's played out that way. Um, like you, I'm excited about the writing, and I like the writing this time because we're going to include multiple standards, um, and we're going to take some time with those, but it's not just that we're hitting narrative writing, but then we're including right. dialogue, and there's a place to pause yeah, to include more good. adjectives and adverbs, and so we're getting integration of a lot of the content and language standards we're working with. So. Um, I think that piece is smart. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, like, I like you, noted the same thing. Um, I like the text complexity. So, you know, I know the whole group stuff is hard, um, but then I just think that kind of chewy, meaty stuff lends itself to richer conversations in the classroom. So, assuming we're not ignoring this piece, you'll see that this time we're getting into some substantial mm -hmm. text complexity, especially with that John Henry poem. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about opportunities to elevate about that in just a moment. Um, I like the fact that uh, there's that little piece about the geese and the queen. And if I notice that it really connects to the work we did about amendments and freedom. Uh, and so for the, what I'm noticing now that we get into you and two is a little bit of coherence. Um, and I value that. And so I think that just, again, for kids who have done unit one, we'll be able to see in unit two um, how that work really builds a requisite background for kids to be successful. Um, the Freyer model, Freyer model is present, so those of you who are familiar with that when you're doing vocabulary. Um, and I guess, you know, sort of in its aggregate, things that you've noticed, the thing that I've noticed, I think that we're going to have some real successes here with mm -hmm. Unit 2. I think so. Um, so those are the things that we like, and then of course, um, there are these opportunities to elevate. And so maybe you can okay. share a few of those things with us. All right, so my first one is the Sanford Harmony SEL program. The lesson, Think Like a Caterpillar, page 47, chapter two. Mm -hmm. um, caterpillar thoughts versus worm thoughts. Worms can have a piece missing and they grow back and they're exactly the same, where a caterpillar becomes a butterfly and changes, which really parallels the changing of characters throughout a story and the actions that it takes for them to change. And um, so that's one way I'm going to do that uh, lesson with the kids. And it's about feelings, relationships, and your view of yourself, uh, how those shape the stories. And that's the same in the lesson. And then another one, I was going to step outside and start a little bit of coding by using Scratch. And stories lend themselves to like a one-page Scratch code where students can give a setting, a character, and maybe lift a line on that same page. So um, emphasize the lift a line that leads more towards students finding character traits and motivations as they're coding that one, one square of code. It's yeah. not a whole program, just a little bit, creating a character that has traits and a lift a line from the text that goes along with it. So to bring a little technology into that and you know it, it involves critical thinking and the text, going through the text again and finding something that would be worthy of that um, code. 
Oh, and I think that's such a great suggestion. And I know, I suspect that a lot of people who are watching aren't familiar with Scratch. It's totally free. And if you're mm -hmm. a little bit intimidated about getting these kids going on coding, um, I have two hacks for you. One is ask the sixth graders mm -hmm. to come in yeah, and teach idea. your kids. Um, and then I've had middle schoolers who get out an hour earlier in our district. And so they've come into my classroom and they've done led nice. some of the tech you're for lucky. us. Mm -hmm. uh, but the kids themselves are really good at figuring it out too. And, and they don't mind if you tell them, I really don't know how to do that, but I'd like you to show me when you when you learn or when you figure it out. They kind of like that. Yeah. Um, so there are, again, I, I see other opportunities here to elevate. Um, one, so the, I'm re-engineering a little bit on the fly with these uh, close reads. So if I read some of these, generally speaking, right, during the mini lesson, it begins with the teacher doing um, the modeling and right, the work. The first one. So what I've done, like I did Aesop Fables today, uh, my kids read it, my kids partner read it. For kids who needed a little bit more support, I was that first read with them. Uh, and then we watched into the mini lesson. So I, I got the fluency activity there. And that's kind of the pattern that I've fallen into, which is each time we work with a text, I have my kids silently read it, they partner read it, and then we get into the mini lesson. And so as many opportunities to do okay. some extra fluency practice, um, again, I see there's value in yielding a little bit of instructional time with that. And these selections are relatively short. Mm -hmm. And so it's not compromising the pace of the day that much by just saying, let's take two or three minutes to read these out loud to our partners. Um, I see uh, lesson nine, week one, um, where the students are all generating ideas for their fable. Right. You mentioned the Sanford curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not using that, I don't know, I suspect you're doing something very similar because Sanford really launches with kids creating guidelines. You know, how is it that we're gonna treat one another in this classroom? And you're kind of funneling them to those ideas right. of being respectful and responsible and kind and being a good listener. And I see that as these could be our fables. So for kids who might be struggling uh, on find, an idea. Yes, on an idea. Mm -hmm. Look, we've already posted, we've already talked about it. And then if you're running something like a morning meeting, we've had multiple opportunities then to talk about uh, some of these outcomes. And then uh, I've included a couple of supplements and these are posted at just two teachers. One is a sentence expansion activity called Because Button So. And I'm not gonna explain what that entire um, activity is, but if you're interested, you can download it. It looks like this where this is one's match to King Midas. And so they've read about King Midas and then it's just a way of, again, embedding stronger sentences in their own writing that are responsible for finishing fragments with these big conjunctions, because, but, and so. Uh, and then I also did one on subjects and predicates where it's all stuff I've lifted from the benchmark material and now uh, it's another opportunity to work with that content but also get to some of those language standards. And my kids are doing that tomorrow. Um, Your subject predicate. And the last one, and again, you know, we kind of waffled on these hot tips or these opportunities to elevate. Mm. I posted um, four of these and they're linked at just2teachers.com within that unit too. And these are other fairy tales that Scholastic um, has written to popular stories like Rapunzel and Hansel and Gretel, but really appropriate for eight and nine year old children. Um, and I'm using these as fluency practice for my kids um, so that each night they're building a little bit of background knowledge on fairy tales and folk tales. And so they just have a really good feel for the general pattern of these days of narrative writing. All right, Marilyn. So we've talked about uh, how unit one went. We talked about what we like in unit two, opportunities to elevate. Uh, let's end with, what are our predictions? How do we think things are going to go? Okay. I predict my mini lessons are still going to be longer than 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And because I also predict that the writing is going to be quite difficult when the students start writing a fable, um, in order to have all the elements, have it make sense, including the dialogue, it's going to take some time and it's going to take longer than a 15 minute mini lesson. So that is my prediction. I'm excited to see what they come up with, but I also know it's going to be hard. So Aaron, what mm -hmm. are your predictions for this unit too? Um, I, I, I anticipate like you do that there's going to be required a little bit of extra scaffolding in some areas mm -hmm. than what's listed in those mini lessons. So like you, I think some of these mini lessons are going to turn into full blown yeah. real lessons. Uh, the John Henry piece uh, comes to mind. 
It's a really challenging piece of poetry. Uh, it's acknowledged as such in the text complexity rubric that begins each one of these units. So I think I'm gonna have to scaffold my mm -hmm. kids into that. Like you with the writing, I don't know if it's enough to do a series of mini lessons. Instead, I think we're gonna have to go a little bit deeper, allow for some richer conversations, um, and then sort of use all those teacher tools uh, so that kids can be really successful with it. Okay. Um, all right, so Marilyn, thank you for our, very much for doing this. Uh, if you haven't noticed, we switched classrooms, so we've done two in mine. We're now in Maryland's. Uh, the classroom is absolutely beautiful. Um, and uh, just those last reminders, please consider subscribing to the blog. We have this Facebook page. It's great that we have some people who are already contributing, adding a few comments. So we love that kind of back and forth dialogue. And we have this website, Just Two Teachers. And we're getting increasingly better about taking some of the resources that we're doing, our building, and we're actually, you know, sort of saving them as Word documents, uploading as PDFs. So I've been doing a couple of because button so's, and I think you gently nudged me and said, you know, instead of just building those in flip charts, maybe you could share those mm -hmm. a little bit more universally yeah. with everybody who might be curious about what you're doing. Yes, I agree. So uh, thank you, everybody, and good luck over the next three weeks as you mess around with uh, Unit 2. We'll see you in a couple as we plan for Unit 3. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks. <laughs> Are you going to ask me a question? <laughs> so, Aaron, yeah. <laughs> okay. This is going uh, in at okay. the end of this thing.